Okay, audio. You getting anything? Hello. Audio. Audio. Can yes. you hear? Audio now. Yes. Awesome. Audio. Yes, we have audio. We have audio. <laughs> okay, we got it. Audio. Got it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to um, great, if, great. If people are watching, they get a lot of um, a lot of enjoyment here behind the scenes. <laughs> okay, great. We get to see my messy desk and back and everything like that. Awesome. And we got a minute or two to go. Very cool. And I can actually mute. Hi, folks. It's uh, noon o'clock here on the West Coast, Pacific time zone, and it's uh, time for another town hall with Bert Sperling. I am Bert Sperling with Sperling's Best Places. So I have my official Sperling's coffee mug here to give authenticity, and it's a great one. Ooh, a little water to keep my throat, uh, throat going. Anyway, it's another town hall. This is the third one of our series. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you today. Lots of interesting things. I hope you're having a wonderful time wherever you are. I hope it's a wonderful day. It's been a great year. We're halfway through the year now. There are some real changes going on, I feel, in the U.S. And I think there's some pretty interesting things happening. So what we're going to go ahead and talk about some of that. I'm going to answer some of your questions as well. 
uh, some of the things that uh, you've written in and uh, spoken about. I see we have a number of viewers on uh, already. And um, so I'm looking forward to talking to you and, uh, and maybe you can give me some of your feedback. You've got a, I think a chat window. You can actually go ahead and converse with me um, and uh, via the, the chat and I can answer questions live or you can ask for some additional information. But um, best places to live, uh, that's a tough one. You know, um, some time ago, I felt that it really didn't matter where you moved. Uh, you were always you, and it really didn't make that much difference where you lived as far as the impact it would have on you as a person. And I think I'm coming around to a much different point of view now that it really has a big impact, aside from just enjoying the things and the, the people around you, uh, it really does have a big impact on you as a person, like your health. Um, for instance, if you are in a spot where people take care of themselves, uh, it's important that uh, they are healthy, uh, they're not overweight, uh, they don't smoke, things like that that have been proven to be, well, I guess as the doctors say, contraindicated uh, to a healthy life lifestyle. If there are people around you who are healthy and they'd rather walk somewhere or, or uh, uh, rather than drive, if they're going to eat healthy food, if they're going to bring uh, quinoa or kale uh, to the potluck instead of, um, say, a marshmallow pie. I'm sort of like those things, you know, where they have this sort of the sweet potatoes or whatever, and then they have the uh, marshmallows, either the big or the small ones on top. Uh, and then you put them in the broiler and they get all melty and, and everything like that. I like that. Uh, that this sort of stuff, that's, that's fun comfort food once in a while, not as a regular diet. I can see that would be kind of problematical. And uh, uh, I, I'd probably probably get pretty heavy or get a lot heavier than I am already um, if I ate that regularly. So the people around you, they have an impact on you. And so it makes a big difference. So what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, try and help you find some of the best places for you to live. You probably found out about this through our website bestplaces.net. Um, it's doing great. Uh, thanks to folks like you that are using it for advice and for research. Um, it's really uh, being very, um, it's very heartwarming to see the comments and the traffic that we have. Uh, and we have uh, new features that we're sharing with you all the time. And um, I'm going to talk about some of those as well. So uh, let's go ahead and hit a couple of the questions here first, uh, and I think that would be uh, pretty cool. Um, someone, let's see, uh, Donna writes in, and uh, I don't know uh, where Donna is from, but uh, she went ahead and said um, she'd like to know about La Trobe, Pennsylvania, and Ligonier, I believe, I'm, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong, uh, but... Um, she wanted to know about those places. Those are two smaller towns, about 10,000 people east of Pittsburgh. I think that's a pretty cool area. Uh, when I say cool, I think it's uh, it's interesting in that it's livable. The Pittsburgh area has lost so much of its population. It used to be one of the largest uh, cities in the US. If you can imagine back around, around 1900, it was like the Chicago is now the United States. It's one of the it was one of the major cities. It was a major industrial town, and it lost incredibly half of its population uh, in over fifty to hundred years. That is devastating. On the upside, because it had all of this history, uh, the Pittsburgh area had so many amenities that were built up by um, well the robber barons like the uh, uh, like Carnegie and Mellon. Uh, and um, those folks uh, had a invested a lot of money. They basically took a lot of money from the people through their trusts and their unethical business practices, uh, but they gave a lot back as well. And as a result of that, it has a great infrastructure that is currently underutilized. So Pittsburgh is coming back really nicely. 
Uh, for a while, I had troubles with um, particulate matter uh, as far as air quality. If that is a concern to you, you might want to check out um, how that's doing. They've stopped their uh, steel producing there in the region that contributed heavily to that. I don't know what the source is of the particulate matter at this point. Particulate matter in air pollution are the really, really small particles. Uh, and you want to be concerned with the ones that are, what, um, 2.5 microns or smaller. They lodge in the lungs. They don't come out. They can't be uh, expelled. And uh, they lodge in there. And they do all sorts of very bad things. A few years ago, Pittsburgh was one of the worst places uh, for, partic for particulate matter in the air. Uh, right now, it's places like Fresno and Bakersfield that are some of the worst. But you want to check for that and to see if uh, that is still the case. I don't believe so. It's gotten better. But if respiratory illnesses are a problem to you, you might want to do some very in-depth investigation. And we can help you with that on our website, bestplaces.net. Uh, but as far as quality, Pittsburgh has a lot going for it. It's a very racially, um, I'm sorry, ethnically diverse place. Lots of different uh uh, folks came from all over, uh, from back um, across from Europe, and there are lots of really interesting neighborhoods in Pittsburgh, and some of that has carried over to the small towns like Latrobe and Ligonier. But um, Don also asked about, uh, so I would de definitely check those places out. I think they have a lot going for them, and then you have the major metro area of Pittsburgh nearby that has all of its amenities. Um, and Pittsburgh is one of the most affordable places that we have these days uh, in the United States um, for the for a city its size, uh, because it is uh, well, it's not like a major center of commerce. But you know, Carnegie Mellon uh, College uh, is a very good place as well, and um, so there are lots going for it. Anyway, uh, talking about, uh, she said, water quality issue in West Virginia. Um, water quality, big problem, big issue with that. I think there's kind of a problem dealing with water quality in that uh, sometimes real problems are not reported and not reported in a timely manner and in a manner that helps people. For instance, look at the Flint, Michigan um, disaster. Uh, and uh, because of that, um, sometimes even the reports themselves uh, are an issue. What I would do is if you're interested in a particular town, look at the reports, every water quality, every water um, facility has to produce annual reports and uh, release those. There isn't, uh, we don't have those on our site because there isn't a, um, a mechanism the federal government hasn't taken all these places and um, uh, they haven't taken all these reports and compiled them in a way that we can use them that would be great if we did but you'll have to talk to the individual uh, boards themselves uh, or the water quality um, facilities and uh, see about that but thanks for your questions and hey this reminds me about Flint Michigan I wanted to say what I think they should do with Flint Michigan is they should prepare to evacuate it. Uh, it's a big step, but here's my thoughts. We can't expect the people in Flint to put up with this any longer. It is a situation that is going to take 10 years or more to try and solve. They're going to solve it perhaps by putting in, replacing lead pipes with um, galvanized plastic. Plastic is what everyone's doing these days. Um, so it will take 10 years or more, and it is completely unreasonable to expect the residents of Flint to put up with this any longer. They should provide uh, funds for people to move. Let's say, I don't know, $20,000 per family or something like that, and maybe uh, so many dollars per person in the family. They should buy the homes. Uh, the homes are nearly worthless right now. No one would want to move to Flint to live there. They should buy out the people at a reasonable price. Maybe I think the median home price in Flint is 
a ridiculous low, ridiculously low fifty or sixty thousand dollars buy out the people that are homeowners and let them move where they want where they can find a healthy lifestyle this is the united states of america we can't let our people suffer through um indifference and uh ineptness uh i think the people need to have options i've seen reports of people who have been interviewed in flint say they would like to move but they don't have the resources pay each of them twenty thousand dollars buy their home if they're homeowners let them move somewhere else let them enjoy a healthy lifestyle for the rest of their life and give them medical care for the problems that they're probably going to be facing for the rest of their lives uh, i think it's only fair and actually when you look at the cost of that that's pretty close to fixing everything in flint and i don't think it can be fixed it's so overwhelming what's been going on there the city i think needs to be basically evacuated i don't know if abandoned is the right word but evacuated uh and the people need to have um some proper health and care given to them that's my take on it i i would love to see something like that happen or at least that dialogue it's going to be 10 years or more maybe 15 years um what was the town in michigan i can't remember the name but uh, lansing i believe lansing uh has been doing the same thing it's taken them even though they've pioneered new methods it's taken them at least 10 years to do much of the same thing and they're not even done yet so um that's my take on flint so let's move to another question uh let's see um people uh want to know about our quiz on our website we are uh we had a, a a quiz on our site a couple of years ago we're busy revamping the site we've completely reworked it the next thing we're going to do is improve our quiz and uh, it's going to be something that I think you'll find really useful and really remarkable. So we are in the process of revamping it and uh, we hear your thoughts. If you have particular things that you're looking for in a quiz, I'd love to hear what they are. This is your chance to give us some input while um, the design is going on uh, and you as a user can go ahead and provide us with some thoughts that would be really, uh, really interesting, I'm sure. For instance, climate. One of the things people are talking about is they want to name what kind of climate they want to live on. But what is a what's a good climate? We know that maybe in the winter we want the winter climate to be as warm as possible um, because we don't like cold weather. But how about the summertime? How hot is too hot? And how um, do you want it cold at night, or uh, do you just want that? hot weather, you know, uh, say 80, 90 degrees, is that good? Is there a place where it becomes absolutely insufferable? Um, so let's say um, Arizona, I think uh, Phoenix area recently hit 120 degrees. That's stunningly hot. Uh, that is much too hot. I was down in uh, Los Angeles area um, doing some work and uh, the Burbank airport when we left uh, was 109 degrees. And that was pretty brutal walking from the rental car place uh, back to the uh, back to the terminal. Um, yeah, I, I guess I could have taken the shuttle bus, but I wanted to see what it was really like. And uh, it was it was very, very hot and dry, really dry. Um, so I would like to know from you folks, what do you feel is um, too hot? What to you is a good climate? Uh, what do you feel is good? And if you have some particulars, we have lots and lots of data, but building a model to go ahead and give you uh, to use your feedback and give you back some answers that are useful for you, uh, that would really be helpful, what you feel is, is a, a good climate. So let's see what else we have. Um, do you know of any sites or tools that can be used to compare more than two cities and then have the ability to download that data? Good question. Um, our site, uh, we're redoing the compare tool right now. It compares two places. We're going to head. Uh, we're going to have uh, up to five or six places you can compare. And if you want to compare a zip code with a city or with a metro area, you can do all of that too in one tool. We don't have a download function, 
but we're going to be offering that and there might be uh might be have a limited functionality that would be for free and if you want to download big data sets uh, then I would say that um, there might be a charge for that for people who are say researchers or real estate investors um, that might be a consideration that's something that we're looking at as well so stay tuned for that let's see what else we have here uh, where do we get our statistics from? Uh, they would like to access information on crime that they were able to find. That's Luana asked that question. So here's the thing on crime. Uh, what we do is we have crime data from the uh, FBI. And now that we've uh, revamped our entire site and everything is uh, all up to date on that and it uh, is all mobile enabled, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be expanding our crime uh, site, crime section to put in uh, lots of data on uh, what the FBI has on specific crimes and that sort of thing. What we have right now are our crime risk indices. Now, our crime risk indices, basically, it has to do with this. The FBI covers 9,000 cities in the US. Uh, they don't cover counties, they don't cover um, uh, metro, well, they do cover some metro areas, but they don't cover, say, down to the zip code level. So here's what we do. What we've done is we've created an analytical model based on the socioeconomic characteristics of a particular place. And so we can go to all the way down to the zip code or even smaller. For instance, we can uh, look at an area, excuse me. Uh, Sperling's mug right there. Great tasting water. So what we can do is we can look at an area. So let, let's let's use this in, as an example. If there's a place that has uh, relatively high uh, expensive homes, uh, if the people are all well educated, if there is a solid family structure with children, uh, with uh, married families, uh, with, uh, let's say people are moving there, uh, they, they want to move there, as I said, their families, they are, um, they're professionals, uh, say they have good jobs, there's low unemployment, the chances are that's going to be a pretty low crime area. And the reason is, is those people are not likely to commit crimes, number one. And number two is they're not likely to live somewhere that has high crime. So what we can do is we can assign a risk score for crime uh, as a pretty low risk for, for crime in that area. Now, one thing we don't do is we don't profile by race or ethnicity. I think that's wrong. I think that's, well, kind of creepy as well. So we don't look at that at all uh, because, frankly, that doesn't have any bearing on crime. But we do look at things like family structure, type of housing, uh, fam, uh, let's see, education level, income, that sort of thing. And by doing that, it's pretty darn accurate. Uh, and in fact, um, I don't know what it is that we do. And uh, I know that insurance agencies are using our data and licensing it to actually write policies using our risk indices. And they're very interested in what we're doing next and, and when we update it. So I think that's, that is pretty compelling uh, and maybe uh, a pretty neat endorsement and, um, in what we do. Now, uh, I think that uh, I have a question from William, uh, who is uh, with an insurance agency that is using some of our, our, our crime risk indices. And William asks, um, when are we going to go down to the block level? So I'm pretty well done with crime risk indices. I'm going to switch um, switch subjects right now, and we're going to get kind of geeky. So um, just let me get into that. What we have on our site, bestplaces.net, is we have everything from the national level, and we're talking about data, and different content, everything from, and we have these profile pages. 
we have everything that goes from the United States level to the state to the 3,142 counties to the 917 metro and micropolitan areas. And those are basically, er those are counties that are grouped together uh, that are similar in the way uh, of different commuting patterns and people that work and they're interrelated. For instance, um, many of the smaller metro areas just have one county. Atlanta has 29 counties comprising the huge Atlanta metro area. The city of Atlanta is only about 450,000 people, close to 500,000 people. The metro area is, oh, I forget what it is, 5 million uh, or more. It's a huge, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tremendous um, engine of uh, economy and uh, people in the, uh, in the South. So that's, uh, that is a metro area. And so when people you know, say, where are you from? They might say, I'm from Atlanta, rather than saying one of the smaller towns uh, that is part of the Atlanta metro area. So we have the, uh, on our site, we have metro areas. We also have cities. We have sort of cities, which are townships and these places which aren't officially cities, they're not incorporated. Uh, but these, there are about 18 states in the U.S. that have these places um, that are part of that. And then we have zip codes. Beneath zip codes, we there are things called block groups and census tracts and all the way down to blocks. We don't show that data, although we do use it uh, in our consolidation and our aggregation to produce the stats you see. Um, we might start showing that as we get into more interactive maps, but right now it's pretty, I don't know of anyone that can tell, that can tell any, that can say what block group they live in or what census tract or, or block for that matter. Uh, it's very tough to get a handle on how those places relate. So we might uh, offer that data as we get into maps, but um, uh, we'll, we'll have to see about that. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, Ruthie says, uh, thanks very much for our site. Uh, and, and she voted to uh, go have something about, um, uh, she's, um, <laughs> the quiz that she takes on her website keeps suggesting that she move to Alaska. And she says, well, she loves warm weather. So when we get our, um, quiz fixed, we'll certainly do that. Um, let's see. Here's uh, Timothy, um, who is from Denver, says he would love to know, he appreciates all of the stats and all the information, but how does one find a, a great place to live in that people are the most important part? and all of the amenities and coffee shops and uh, museums, um, bike trails, everything like that is all important. Great restaurants, all those get mentioned often. But what is, what are the people like? What's it actually like to move there? And um, I can certainly, he says uh, interestingly about Denver that um, he doesn't, he's grown to let's just say that the people um he's not he's not too happy with his fellow residents that live there um they're kind of pretentious and um there are friendly people and uh there but there are not of a, not enough of them to to suit timothy and he'd like to know uh if he's he's thinking about Boise, and he can easily afford to buy a house there, and that's the, the beauty. If you're moving from Denver, which is hot right now, Denver is very close to Portland in its um, currently what's going on. There's a lot of development. A lot of people are moving there. Those are two cities, Portland, Oregon, and Denver, that are very, very popular right now, and they are really uh, enjoying uh, a lot of in-migration. And the property houses, or the property values are rising quite a bit. 
So what Timothy is thinking about doing is what if he moves to Boise? Well, he can cash in, uh, or I guess cash out of uh, Denver, then move to Boise and um, be able to uh, come out way ahead, have an, uh, a bit of a nest egg and uh, have a great place to live. But he wants to know what the folks in Boise are like. Well, good question. Um, here's what I would suggest, Timothy, because I can't tell you, you know, the kind of people you, uh, that you're looking for. And some people uh, I've heard uh, some places, people are sort of aloof. It's hard to break in. People are outwardly friendly, but it's hard to break into sort of a society to a, uh, or to the local culture uh, and the people. I guess what I would suggest is this. Um, if you can try to spend a vacation there, try to move there for a short time, make a, a temporary thing. And in fact, um, thanks to things like Airbnb, maybe you can have um, find the sort of neighborhood where you would be interested in living. Try that out. Find a place that's uh, available, uh, a host uh, house, live in that neighborhood, um, and then see what the people are actually like. Try hard to engage everyone. You sound like a person who knows what they want. Uh, and try hard to engage the people and see what it's actually like. Here's something you might try. If, uh, you're, if you're interested in certain hobbies, maybe there are other like-minded people. If you're musicians, maybe there are people that play the same kind of music you do. If you like, uh, say, automobiles, uh, biking, uh, photography, whatever, maybe there are places, uh, groups that have similar types of interests, and you can see what the people are like there. Um, for instance, I've heard here in Portland uh, among musicians that it's a very welcoming and open type of environment where the musicians aren't always regarding every other uh, player as a com as a competitor uh, trying to get a gig that they deserve. Uh, but what I've heard is that it's a pretty open and sharing um, place. That's good to know. And uh, so you wouldn't find that out unless you talk to some of the people um, that maybe have share your kind of interest. Um, you might also talk to businesses that cater to the kinds of things that you're interested in they might know of some sort of groups as well uh, that could that could be helpful. Um, and they might have type of uh, things where they have in their shops themselves. Uh, they might have um, meetups, uh, groups where people can uh, uh, get together and exchange ideas, do whatever it is they do. Uh, they have this one thing here in Portland, it's board gaming. And uh, they get together, I, I went, went by with, uh, with my family uh, late one night. It was like, I don't know, uh, 10 o'clock at night. It was absolutely crammed with people, this large building. Everybody had their board games, and they're all actively engaged in board gaming. So who knows what's out there? Uh, maybe there's some interesting cultures, and I bet you could do some research that would be very valuable. Uh, and... Um, uh, find out some things that would, could give you a hint. Now, this uh, goes ahead and reminds me about our website. Circling back to best places, what I think is really valuable is, you know, we provide a lot of information to best places. It's free, don't require anything, but what I'd love from you is if you could tell me about where you live. In fact, better than telling me, if you could post something on the website and share about where you live, because you are the expert where you live. Nobody knows more about the block where you live, the neighborhood you live in, and the city where you live. I would love to hear, and so would everybody else, would love to know about where you live. And if you could share that, you could provide some insights like uh, to someone like Timothy to give him some ideas on what the people are like. So that's what I would really like from you. If you could give back to best places and uh, share about where you are. So let's see what else we have here. 
Is there a way to rank cities by state by air quality? And I'd love to know the rankings of cities in California by air quality from best to worst. Love your site, been using it for years, getting close, and close to making a decision on where to retire. Definitely want California, hoping to find more air areas with cleaner air. Okay, well, let's talk about California and cleaner air. The Central Valley is problematical. Um, they have problems with pollution. So I'm afraid you're gonna find that. Uh, I would also talk, uh, I would also take a look at the site Clean Air. Um, state of the, I think it's State of the Air. Uh, it's from the, oh boy, I could look that up in a hurry here probably. I think it's called State of the Air. Um, it's the, um, just hold on for just a minute here. I'm gonna look that up. They have a bunch of ratings. American Lung Association, that's it. So the American Lung Association has a website called State of the Air, and they review uh, a lot of information and they have ratings. Uh, you can drill down by California and take a look at what they have there. It's good. Uh, we also have got a lot of data, new data from the federal government as far as toxic emissions and particulate matter, ozone. We're going to be putting that up on our site. Uh, it's not going to be right away, but I would say sometime in by the fall, we're going to um, get that and uh, have you take a look. Uh, so you can have a look at that. It's going to have very interesting things. Cancer risk by county and also um, by, let's see, what else is there going to be? Uh, respiratory people with respiratory illnesses so it's the level of respiratory risk and stress uh we're going to have that on our website i hope you'll uh, take a look for that um let's see for some reason my chat window is not coming up for whatever reason and i'm not sure why uh, i hear that i we do have some chats but I'm not getting anything, so I don't know why. Um, I'm going to try and fix that while I'm on the air. Uh, let me just go ahead and hold on for a minute here. Sorry for the dead air. We can all take a break. Hmm. It just says, not seeing, I'm going to type in the chat, not seeing any messages. Okay. Okay. So let's see, I've got a note from my uh, engineer. We can open the link in another window. Okay, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open up uh, another link here to our chat. We'll see what we can, we can look at for there. Just a moment. Okay, great. Well, that's kind of eerie. I'm seeing myself live. Okay, um, let's see what we have here. I'm going to look for Penny's question. So please bear with me. Um, great. Penny said, what are the biggest stumbling blocks when re relocating? For instance, um, Connecticut to Charlottesville, Virginia. Biggest stumbling blocks. Wow, that's that's a tough one. Um, let me think for a minute. Uh, Charlottesville, we named in, in our book, by the way, is one of the, well, as the very best place to live in our book that came out Oh, uh, about what 
10 years or so ago called Cities Ranked and Rated. Charlottesville is a great place to live if you can afford it. Prices have continued to go up. Uh, part of the issue is that um, it has a great university there, a University of Virginia, uh, and uh, it's very desirable. Uh, it is a great place to live, and so many great places to live are desirable. That makes them more expensive. Um, but thankfully, it hasn't uh, gotten overwhelming as far as the, um, the growth. Uh, I did speak with some of the people with a zero growth initiative, and they had some very good ideas uh, about growth and really how it is not terribly helpful. So the biggest stumbling blocks, Penny, getting back to your thing about what are the biggest stumbling blocks when relocating? Uh, I would say maybe finding, uh, finding the right house, the right neighborhood. Um, I think a lot of it varies if you have, for instance, children, if you're by yourself. Um, I would say that if it's a right, finding out if it's a right fit for you as far as the the lifestyle there in the neighborhood. And I would say the way you can perhaps minimize making a mistake is to try it out beforehand. The longer you can uh, try to stay somewhere, um, if, you, if it's only for a week, that's great. If it's only for a weekend, that helps if you can go different times of the year. For instance, people come to the Northwest uh, of the country where I, where I live at this point, uh, and the summers are beautiful. In fact, they're pretty perfect. Um, but nine months out of the year, we have an oppressive cloud cover and uh, drizzle. To some people, they just cannot take that. It is just um, very, well, I guess sort of depressing and cold. Even though the temperature rarely drops below freezing, uh, the cold sort of gets into your bones. And uh, that can be pretty um, frustrating. And people just can't take that. So the more you can visit, uh, the more you can avoid any sort of mistakes and make sure, uh, and try and make friends with people and get and see what it's actually like to make friends. Uh, when you're there. Uh, sometimes people can be, what I've heard, outwardly friendly, polite, kind, nice, but trying to be part of them as a, on a friend level, on a daily or weekly level, uh, some, some places can be kind of tough to break into that. So anyway, um, our old, uh, Penny asks also, are older people suffering more from cold like Portland, Maine, or heat and humidity in Charlottesville? Uh, that's a good question. I think that, uh, Penny, if we're just talking about suffering as far as like a uh, fatality, uh, heat stroke is the biggest issue uh, when it comes to that. So I would say more people, more older, elderly die from uh, heat exposure uh, and a combination of high temperature, high humidity, and high temperatures at night, when it doesn't get cold at night, you have problems uh, where you can't recover um, during the nighttime to prepare for the day. So I guess suffering, I would say more people probably suffer from high heat and high humidity. Um, and I don't know if Charlottesville is that bad com uh, compared to uh, some other places like um, New Orleans where you break into a sweat just reading a book. So, uh, let's see. Any Philly suburbs or Bucks, Bucks County towns come to mind? Oh, I'll have to do some research on that. Um, there are some good ones. And let me just talk about suburbs um, right now. What's happening in the U.S.? This is kind of interesting. What's happening in the U.S. is, uh, and I've seen this all over, even in places like L.A., we took a car trip. Uh, my wife Gretchen and I got in our Honda and took a drive across the country, uh, 10,000 miles. 
all through the deep south um, and uh, of course the west and everything like that because we're coming from portland oregon what our finding is that the inner cities people want the urban experience after fleeing and going to um, the suburbs during the 60s and 70s, 80s, people now say, I want to live in a city. And the more sort of urban experience, I want to be surrounded by places I can walk to. I want to have a high density lifestyle. And I don't want to, and also they don't want to commute a long time. They are giving up that maybe a fenced yard or some acreage for uh, a shorter commute or maybe one where they can bicycle or take a bus, take the light rail, something like that. So what's happening is prices are being driven up all over the country uh, and places are being overdeveloped. Uh, older uh, homes are being torn down and big new expensive ones are being constructed. So what's happening is there's more and more competition for the places in cities. Um, that means, on the other hand, for us folks that are older, maybe looking at retiring, or we are not, uh, let's say we're telecommuters, we don't work downtown in an office building, we can afford then to move out a bit. If we're not doing a commute every day, then we're not going to get involved in the uh, sort of the um, trying to be out trying to outbid everyone to live in a place that has coffee shops nearby or restaurants, that sort of thing. If we're willing to go ahead and run counter to the pre prevailing uh, urge that people have to live in the cities, there are better deals now to be had. Um, it's more affordable comparatively to live out of the city and live in the outer ring. So you can still enjoy say, uh, the great amenities of a major metropolitan area. And you have sports teams, you have uh, theater, um, you have concerts, you have great restaurants, um, shops, all these sort of things that a large city has to offer. If you don't need to live as close as possible to the center or in some funky neighborhood, if you want to live a more suburban lifestyle, those places are often much more affordable than comparatively than they were before. So think about that if you're looking for some place. Okay, so um, someone says, uh, thanks for your point of view on Flint, Michigan. Uh, and uh, someone named Sideways Russian says, Tampa is too hot now. That's interesting. Um, Let's see what else we have. Um, could uh, someone, uh, maybe this is Penny says, could we have a way to sign up for a particular swirling coming attraction, a, such as county risk, cancer risk by county, so that becomes available um, and we can be notified by text or mail? Good question. Um, what you can do is go to our site and sign up to be a member. If you're not already a member, uh, become one and you'll get emails from us and we'll be happy to let you know when new features come up. And um, so do that. In fact, I have something really exciting to announce. If you go to any one of uh, any lo location on our site, any profile, uh, your hometown or say Austin, Texas, which is popular, go to there at the county level, go to the crime section. We have new maps. Thanks to Nick, uh, our resident um, cartographer. Uh, Nick has been producing some amazing maps. These are live and uh, it has our crime risk index uh, that is mapped out and that's called a coral pleth map uh, with shading. It's dynamic, so you can zoom in and in or out um, to see the surrounding region, and you can also pan around the area. We're going to be putting those maps all over the website, 
you, uh, what we are asking you to do is to become a member. Uh, so those are available to the members. That's another great reason to become a member. So um, Rick uh, calls in and uh, writes in and said, what are your thoughts for the Detroit area's future? It's a good question, Rick. Detroit, well, it's a lot like Pittsburgh was. Uh, Pittsburgh um, was one of the engines of prosperity for the United States. And it, uh, the steel industry basically went elsewhere. Now, some people, some politicians will tell you that the, that the Chinese and the Japanese, uh, or the Chinese in particular, uh, not the Japanese, but the Chinese and other foreigners have basically decimated our steel industry. Well, that's an easy answer, but it's not really correct. Uh, what's happening now is there's no way that the steel jobs are going to come back because the steel industry has completely changed. Um, steel is still being produced here in the U.S., but it's much, much more efficient. And towns like Pittsburgh uh, and other places in the U.S., they, their infrastructure has become obsolete due to new technology and new smelters are... Um, in place that are much more efficient and they hire a lot less people. So it would be great to blame the Chinese on all our problems, but a lot of it too is that time and technology is marching on and changes are being made um, and those jobs are evaporating because of the way uh, the new industry is evolving. So getting back to um, Detroit. Detroit was, in 1950, was one of the largest cities in the United States. It was uh, the head of the automotive industry. It was a, just a, uh, a major economic um, powerhouse in the U.S. However, things have changed, uh, of course, and a lot of it, I think maybe what the the thing is for Detroit, it has a lot of uh, homes that are spread out over the area that really can't be maintained because it's a, it's a very large uh, city geographically. And the downtown core is beginning to prosper thanks to the sort of the Quicken Loans type. Uh, there's a the company Quicken Loans, which is uh, making a heavy investment. Uh, in the area, but that's just the downtown core. There's so much of the city surrounding it, which is basically abandoned. It's a wasteland. And people, if there are listeners out there that are looking, if you're bold, if you're brave, if you're a pioneer, you could make a start by going to a place like uh, what I call opportunity cities. And these are cities that are, that have seen better days, places like, um, Rochester, Syracuse, Cleveland, Detroit, places that are are down, but they're not out, and they're resilient because they have had hard times for quite a while. But they're a great place for a person with energy and bravery to take a chance on making an impact on a community like that. Um, it's sort of like urban pioneering, urban homesteading. And I think it's a great, a great opportunity for people uh, to be able to do that. So uh, what's going to happen? I think, well, I don't know. You know what I, what frustrates me with the United States at this point is that we are so intolerant of uh, taking a chance. Um, there's so much pressure not to make a mistake that really politicians and everyone else can't make they can't afford to make a mistake because they're going to be they're going to be crucified in the press and the media because they made a mistake just like this uh solyndra which the u.s um tried to um have uh help the solar panel industry uh that's been seen as a terrible disaster really it's not a it's not any worse than a venture capitalist trying to invest in the business. Most firms that venture capitalists invest in fail. That's okay. At least people are trying. So I'd like to see people do things with Detroit that are bold. Let's see how it goes. 
some of the things might be to um, there are whole parts of the city which are basically going to ruin. Uh, bulldoze them, put in urban farms, just leave them, let them, uh, say, landscape them, put something in, let that come back, and uh, just try and concentrate the people in one area. The people that still want to live in Detroit, let them sort of concentrate and focus on an area where you can um, supply services to them. Because right now, when you think about it, if there's just a couple of houses way off in the middle of nowhere, there's nowhere else around, think how expensive it is to supply water, electricity, uh, gas, if they have that, fire services, police, garbage collection. Those places, those remaining residents should be concentrated so that, that they, can, they can have a higher quality of life and they can uh, be able to live more efficiently. So don't know where it's going to go. I hope there's good things in the future, um, but so much work has to be done. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have. Um, great, uh, people are actually uh, communicating with each other in our chat. I think that's wonderful. Uh, giving some information on uh, Ormond Beach and uh, how it compares to uh, Daytona Beach. That's very cool. And someone says, what is a good place for, a, for single 60-year-old women? What? Um, I don't know. I guess the, the question I would have is what is, what would a 60 year old woman, how would that be different than any other 60 year old? Uh, thankfully, there are less and less sort of differences involved um, where it's, say, different for a woman than it is for a man or, or, or people of a, a specific race or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, I'd be interested to know what would women look for in particular that would be uh, different than, say, a 60-year-old man, for instance. I could see where maybe it would be different from, say, a couple that's 60 uh, or so, but um, uh, I'm not sure which ones would be in particular good for, well, you know, one thing you could use our site for is to look for concentration of like-minded people. Um, some people love college towns. Uh, college towns, uh, even though it has the opposite of a lot of uh, people who are uh, in their um, uh, latter life stages, so to speak, uh, some people love college towns because it is very, very vibrant. And uh, there's always something happening. Uh, the kids, the 18 to 21 year olds and uh, they are always um, have a lot of energy looking for things to do. And uh, there are the sports events, of course, the concerts. Uh, and there's also a great opportunity to audit classes in many cases. So uh, I would definitely um, say that. Oh, and I think it is perhaps uh, Patty has suggested meetup.com. Meetup is a really great uh, site. And what it does is that there are all these, there are all these different things going on in the community that really it's tough to keep on top of. But you can, with this meetup.com, basically it tells when like-minded people like yourself um, are holding meetings to do things. Maybe it's uh, something like a a sports league, or it could be a particular interest, uh, photography or kayaking or whatever it is, there are people meeting up to do that. And these websites like meetup.com uh, will let you um, get in touch with that and find out where those are located. It's a great way to build community. And in fact, uh, going back to Timothy's question, what's Boise like? That would be a great idea to see what's active in the Boise area. So meetup.com. Timothy, take a look at that. Uh, let's see what else we have. Um, someone says, uh, try out Airbnb. I think that's a, a great idea for uh, checking out a place. And let's see what else we have here. <clears throat> 
We're getting close to the end of our uh, hour-long town, town hall. I can't believe how quickly time goes. It's great talking with everyone. Uh, and uh, if I can't hear back from you, maybe that's something we'll work out in the future where you can um, uh, call in and uh, I can actually see where you are and uh, have you speak to me uh, in person. I think that'd be a lot of fun. We're going to work on that technology. Let's see what else. We have lots of questions from people. Oh, um, Cubby uh, writes in and says they're getting re ready to retire. And uh, they both enjoy Northern California, but can't afford the cost of living. Boy, that's true. So much of California is just not affordable. Um, they'd like to live in Florida, but they can't endure the heat or humidity. Uh, but the husband would like to golf year round. So anyway, uh, kind of tough to know where to go. But here's my thought. I would go to some place that's uh, warm, but not too hot. Now it's not exactly four seasons, uh, but I like sort of the high desert area uh, around El Paso or in El Paso. There's not a lot of around El Paso, it's simply El Paso um, in West Texas. And it is, um, it has a lot going for it. Uh, it has um, a climate that is hot, but it's, I don't think it, really gets so uncomfortably hot like Phoenix, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, low humidity, and it, because it's the high desert area, this is where it's important when it's when you're at a high altitude, uh, and it's not too high, but it, it's reasonably high. When, it's, when you're at high enough altitude, it gets cool at night. So you might have higher temperatures in the 90s during the day, but then it drops down to something quite uh, comfortable at night and lets you sort of uh, recover nicely and uh, then prepare for the next day. So take a look at the El Paso area. Um, their economy is coming back really nicely in the last couple of years. Uh, and I think it's a great place for retirees. It is a little bit isolated in West Texas, but hey, you got a, a good airport there. And um, it is, uh, I wouldn't say it's, um, maybe cosmopolitan, but it's certainly, it's a, a unique, it has a lot of unique characteristics that you won't find in too many other places. If you're coming from, say, the Northeast, uh, it is like another world uh, with its heavy um, Hispanic and Mexican culture. It's right there on the border. So we're at the end of our hour. I don't want to go ahead and uh, talk all day, but it's been a treat, and I feel so lucky to be able to speak to you and I feel very thankful uh, that you're able to use our website uh, and please I'd love to know what you think about where you live and so I can share uh, I have a lot to learn from you so I'd love for you to share I can pass along what you what you're telling me to other people other people can read it and um, it will be a, a great gift so Thank you so much for listening. This is Bert Sperling, bestplaces.net. And I hope wherever you are, it's a beautiful day and you live in the best place yourself. See you later.